Welcome back everyone to another episode of Design Today. Man, I miss saying that. We've got a whole new season of Design Today ready to rock and roll, and I thought it would be perfect to start off with a bang and air an episode that I recorded last fall with a true stud, Nir Eyal. This episode of Design Today is brought to you by me. Design Today is more than just a podcast. We are building a community of hungry UX designers. Want to join that community? Head over to designtoday.com and sign up to receive a Slack channel invite. Do you really want to show your love and support for the show? Then consider becoming a patron. As you know, this work is a labor of love and any donation not only means a ton, but goes a long way in fueling the engine. Visit designtoday.com to learn more about our community and resources. Now back to the show. Nir is the author of two awesome books that I'm sure you've probably heard of. His first became a Wall Street Journal bestseller titled Hooked, How to Build Habit-Forming Products. His second, released last year, in which I devoured in just a couple weeks, is called Indistractable, How to Control Your Attention and Choose Your Life. For those who've gotten to know me over the last couple of years now, know that this was something I was eager to read. When Nir came to Utah and spoke at a local event, I couldn't hold back from asking him to join me on the show. He graciously agreed, and here we are. Nir has been on a ton of podcasts, all of which I've listened to. I tried my best to dig into topics, to hear him expound on thoughts I had not yet heard him speak on, so listen close. I butchered his name and I got a little starstruck at the beginning of the recording, uh, but I decided to leave that in there because everyone deserves a good laugh today. So let's get to it. Mr. Year, Nier Al, did I say that right? Nier yeah. Al? <laughs> take two. Nier, Nier Al. 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 Yes. Al. Al. All right. We're going to take two on that one. Okay. Nier. <laughs> We have a good blooper reel here. That's great. You know what? The, the truth of the matter is I'll probably keep all this in here just <laughs> yeah, so everyone not? knows how bad I am at this. It's, uh, it's part of the fun. <laughs> Mr. Nir Eyal, uh, I appreciate you taking the time to jump on the podcast and, uh, and, and join him here. Thank you. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Uh, we were able to meet up at a product type event that you did here in Utah. What? Uh, let me think. Two months back, two and a half months back, maybe three months back. I can't remember now. Yeah, just about, right? Uh, was that part of a speaking tour that you were doing? It ended up being, yeah. I was in town for a wedding. And oh. uh, while I was in town, I figured it uh, might be a great opportunity to connect with the local product community. Because the, there's a lot going on in Utah when it comes to tech. I love it. Every time I come, it's like the scene gets better and bigger. It definitely does. And you were here, it was probably a year before that, right? Right, right. I've been a few times now. I did a, a few talks with Hooked, and then I, I did yep. an early talk of Indistractable, kind of a teaser to, before the book was even published to, to kind of uh, work through some of the material. And then I came back and did the real thing. So admittedly, I wasn't there at the, uh, the product hive where you talked about the Hooked book, uh, but I heard from everyone who attended about what a fantastic experience it was for them. Thank uh, you. And, uh, you know, I had to make sure that I didn't miss it the next time you came through. And uh, fortunately, I was able to be there for uh, your conversation on Indistractable and uh, got to read the book uh, since that event, uh, follow along on some of your podcasts, and you've been busy over the last couple months. Yeah, it's been great. Uh, the book is definitely having an impact, which is awesome. I mean, I really wrote the book for me, to be honest, uh, because I had this dilemma. I had this problem of constantly feeling like I was distracted. Uh, I you know, would sit down at my desk and I wouldn't do what I said I'm going to do. And then uh, when I was with my family members, I would still, you know, get distracted by my devices. And so I was constantly struggling with distraction, uh, ironically, because I started to have some success as an author. Uh, I started writing actually just for fun. Uh, and really? So, yeah. So I sold two tech companies. I, you know, I'm a product person is my background. And I started writing just for fun to kind of work through some ideas in my own head around how to build habit forming products. I really, I didn't see a book on this topic of how to build habit forming products. So I decided to come up with my own methodology. 
And I actually self-published Hooked at first thinking, okay, maybe a few thousand people would, would, would like to buy it or you know, I'll give it out for free. Actually, originally I gave it out for free to my blog mm. subscribers. And then the, the busier I got because the book started getting good reviews and then it was professionally published and you know, now it's sold a quarter million copies. So the busier I got because of the success of Hooked, the less time I had to do the thing that made me successful, which was to research and write. And so I, I had this problem that I think many professionals feel these days that, you know, when you do well at your job, you have more distractions to try and cope with. Uh, so that was on the professional side. And then on the personal side, there was this, you know, the, 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 the seminal moment for me was that I was getting so distracted that at one point I was with my daughter, we had this afternoon together and uh, we had this activity book of things that daddies and daughters could do together. And one of the things in the book was to ask each other this question that if you could have any superpower, what superpower would you want? Mm -hmm. And I wish I could tell you what she said, but I can't because in that moment I was distracted by my device and I wasn't paying attention to her. And she got the hint that whatever was on my phone was more interesting than she was. And she left the room and I'd blown it. And so that was really the kind of the seminal moment of man. Like if I know how this stuff is designed to be so habit forming and so potentially distractive, distracting, the, the, if hooked was about how to build good habits, yeah. then maybe I should work on this question of how do we break bad habits. And so that's, that was kind of the genesis for indistractable. Yeah. Do you, uh, I, I'm curious because I, I read that chapter in the book. That's kind of how you preface the book is with that story. I'm curious if you even recall what was on your phone at that moment. No, of course not. <laughs> we never do, right? Like right. how many times have you said to yourself, hmm, I wonder what time it is. I don't know about you, like for, for many yep. years, I didn't, I didn't have a wristwatch. So I would say, what time is it? I'd pick up my phone and say, okay, let me just look at the time real quick. And then, oh, look, there's a notification. Let me just open that. Or there's an email. Let me just check out wait, what time is it? <laughs> like, right. why did I pick up my phone? Yep. <laughs> and so the same thing happened in, in the case with my daughter. I, I probably some email or, you know, internet silliness caught my attention. And it's funny how something that was so small and, and, you know, as we look back in hindsight, we're calling it so meaningless. Uh, but this moment with your daughter had such profound impact. Why do you think that was? Why do you think this moment was the pivotal moment for you? Because I think when it, when it comes to distraction, it's really easy to um, to discard the the not obvious distractions, so that you know when I was getting distracted at work, uh, I would say I would get distracted. Not I wasn't I wasn't on Facebook at work. Mm -hmm. I wasn't on uh, you know I wasn't checking out ESPN or something that was obviously frivolous during working right. hours. I was checking email and email seems worky, right? That's kind of a work-related task. It's something that needs to get done at some point. And so that was that didn't have the resonance uh, because I would rationalize it. So oh, okay, well, just that stuff needs to get done at some point. So that's kind of a, a work-type task. It's okay if I do that. Uh, whereas something that, that you really can't ignore, like, you know, I wanted to be with my daughter and I'm looking at my stupid phone, like, what mm -hmm. the hell, why, why, <laughs> why am I cheating myself and my relationship with my daughter there? And so that kind of opened this bigger question, the more I thought about that, and I, I felt bad for what had happened. And to be honest, it didn't just happen once, it happened on more than one occasion. Right. But as I processed it, I realized that the superpower I would want, if I could have any superpower in terms of behavior change, it would be to be indistractable. Like how amazing would it be, I thought, if I just did what I said I was going to do, right? I don't need to leap tall buildings in a single bound. I don't need to be like Spider-Man and, you know, that'd be cool. But like, practically speaking, how amazing would it be if when I said I was going to exercise, I exercised? Right. When I said I was going to eat right, I would eat right. When I said I was going to meditate or pray or do, or do anything that I think is important to me, if I was going to say I'm going to be fully present with my daughter, how amazing would my life be if I actually just did that thing, <laughs> right? Right. Like we already all know what to do, at least, you know, in t the, today with the internet, you know, Google it. If you don't know how to do something, it's all right there. It's all accessible. The problem is not that we don't know what to do. We all know what to do, right? We all basically know how to lose weight. We know how to live a healthier life. We know how to do our jobs better. We just need to do the work. <laughs> sure. So my question was, why don't we just do it? Why is it so hard to do the stuff that you know you should do? And so that really was, was the question I wanted to answer. Was it after that event then with your daughter that you started going down this research hole? Yeah, yeah. And I didn't set out to say, I'm going to write a book. Right. Um, because uh, many times when I, when, you know, the, the, 
I, I've had dozens of book ideas that went nowhere uh, sure. because they started out as problems. So when I wrote Hook, the problem was how do you build habit forming products? I found a lot of books that tell you how to build habits, a lot of books on how to build products, but no books on how to build habit forming products. Yeah. And so that's really the book I wanted to write because nobody else had covered that topic. When it came to distraction, I bought a whole bunch of books uh, on focus and productivity. Um, and I, I found a lot of books about technology and the effect that technology has on our attention. And Basically, the, the, the takeaway from all these books that I read was that technology is the problem, right? Technology yeah. is melting your brain. Technology is addictive. Technology is hijacking this, that. And so I did what the books told me to do. I got rid of the tech. I got myself a flip phone. Uh, I got myself a word processor with no internet connection. I did the digital detox, the whole 30-day thing. It didn't work for me. Right. And it didn't work for me because it didn't address the root cause of the problem. It's like when I, was, I used to be clinically obese. and um, I would go on the same fad diets, right? 30 days, no junk food. Well, of course, you know what happens on day 31, right? You're like you make up for lost time. Ah, you eat everything, right? And so that's exactly what happens when we go on these technology digital detoxes because we think that technology is the problem and it's not the, the source of the problem. It's what we call a proximal cause. It's the symptom, not the disease. Right. So it's interesting that uh, you, you've talked about, I've heard you talk about the obesity. I've also heard you talk about uh, your desire to get into the gym and work out. You told the story on another podcast about the dollar bill that you've got in the office or the hundred dollar bill. The hundred dollar bill. bill. Oh, yeah. okay. So we're, okay. So it, yeah, you want, you have to explain well, more about that? Well, and the one of the thing that I found it was interesting about it was that you talk about how uh, you don't consider yourself a champion of being indistractable, that you're still trying to discover these techniques uh, to, I don't know, continue to hone in your skill. It sounds as if though, the results that you've got with uh, your health, the results that you've achieved with, uh, you know, getting to the gym, you found a way to crack the system. Well, so I would definitely call myself indistractable. I don't call myself a master of self-control. Okay, that's, that's a good I, definition. I, yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's a big difference. So I'm, I'm, very, I'm a stickler on words, right? I'm an author. So words yeah. really, really matter. So the beauty of creating a word, so I made up this word indistractable, and I can define it any way I want because <laughs> I made up the word. <laughs> so the definition of becoming indistractable, being indistractable means you are the kind of person who strives to do what they say they're going to do. It does not mean you never get distracted. I still get distracted from time to time, but here's the difference. I know why I get distracted and I can do something about it so that I don't keep getting distracted by the same thing again and again and again. Uh, pa uh, Paulo Coelho said that a mistake repeated more than once is a decision. It's yeah. such a great quote because if yeah. we keep getting distracted, but if you keep making the same mistake, you make the mistake once, okay, you know, mea culpa, right? But if you don't do anything to fix the source of the problem, now you've made a decision. Yep. And so the idea here is when you become indistractable, you don't keep getting by this, distracted by the same thing again and again and again. You realize why you got distracted and you can dismantle it so that you, you fix the problem. And this was something that I did constantly, right? There's this, that quote that is attributed to Einstein, even though he probably never said it, which is that <laughs> uh, insanity is doing the same thing, expecting different results. Right. And this is exactly what I was doing every day. I would get distracted by the same thing. I would keep procrastinating. I would, you know, half of my to-do list would get recycled from one day to the next, to the next, to the next. And there wasn't any, any progress made on trying to tackle these distractions. So it's not that you never get distracted. Being indistractable doesn't mean you never get distracted. It means you strive to do what you say you're going to do. Now, what I don't believe in is willpower and self-control and self-discipline. Because all of those three things, and this is kind of the conventional thinking, and I remember when I used to be obese, you know, I would hear this all the time, even just saying the word self-discipline kind of sends shivers down my spine because I was told, like, have some self-discipline. Why are you eating so much, right? Like, and that wasn't helpful at all because the fact of the matter is that in the moment, willpower and self-discipline and, and self-control don't work. Mm -hmm. they, they, that in fact, people who we think of as having high self-discipline and high self-control, they don't exert a lot of willpower in the moment. What they really do, their secret, is they set up systems to not get distracted in the first place. That's the difference, yeah. right? That person who's in super amazing shape, that person who eats right, the person who's super productive at work, the person who doesn't struggle with distraction, what you will find is they're not heroes of willpower. 
they have a system in place. And so that was the system. I was jealous of people who I knew who didn't seem to get distracted and I wanted to unpack the system. And so that's where this research from Indistractable came from. So let me talk about how one gets down this path of, uh, you know, assessing their, their own system. You know, for you, you had this light bulb moment or maybe multiple light bulb moments with your daughter. Uh, but how does someone who's listening assess, you know, what it is that uh, they need to, to change? You know, how do they ex assess the triggers, as you call them in your book? Yeah, so it really starts with your values. So I'm not here to tell you what your values should be. Uh, mm -hmm. I think that the values, are, the definition of values are the attributes of the person you want to become. And so it's not up to me to decide what your values should be. That's up to you. But whatever your values are, I want to help you live out those values. And so one of the things that we have to do in the path to becoming indistractable is to turn our values into time. You know, so many of us, like I used to say, I used to say, oh, yeah, taking care of my health is very valuable. If you ask me, you know, what, what, what are my values? I, uh, an attribute of the person I'd want to become is to have this value of taking care of my physical health, right? How valuable is it that we, we have bodies that, that uh, can support us into old age and who aren't falling apart? Like that's, a, that's an important value of mine. But if you looked at my calendar, you see no time for that, right? Another one of my values was, was to be a, a caring friend, right? To be available to my friends, to, to know others intimately and have them know me. But again, if you looked at my calendar, where was that time for regular right. meetings with friendships? Right. Uh, if you think, if I thought, think about my values for work, right? Like I want to be the kind of person who can come up with novel solutions to hard problems, right? But how can you do that if you don't have time for reflection in your day? And so as opposed to, I think, some of the current methodology of, you know, make a vision board, make a five-year plan, have a big hairy goal, that stuff is so far off. It's so far into the future. As opposed to the five-year vision, how about we just start with next week, right? How can you live out your values next week by turning your values into time? I think that's mm -hmm. one of the most important places to start is to understand how we want to spend our day. And this tactic is, uh, is, is super important. It's actually step two of four of, of right. becoming indistractable. And it's, it's so important because if you don't define what you want to do with your time, if you don't plan your day, somebody's going to plan it for you. Right, sure. whether it's what's going on in the news, or your friends want this, and your daughter wants this, and your uh, spouse wants this, and your boss asks for that, something is going to eat up your day unless you define what you want to do with it. So if you don't plan your day, somebody else will. And the fact of the matter is, if you you can't call something a distraction unless you know what it distracted you from. If you have a big open calendar, as two thirds of Americans do, two thirds of Americans don't keep any sort of a calendar. Well. If that's the case, how dare you call something a distraction? What did it distract you from? Right. <laughs> Nothing? Of course. If you have big white space in your day, of course you're, you're, you're going to find something to eat up that time, right? Whether it's Facebook or Twitter or the news or God knows whatever else, something is going to claim that time unless you decide what you want to do with it. No, and that idea totally resonated with me. I mean, I think people could spend years in therapy trying to figure out what it is that they value. Um, and but it's, me, it's actually not that hard. It's, uh, sorry to cut you off. I think no. part of the problem is we ask people to sit down and say, define your values. I think that's a really tough task. Like, it I is. don't know. <laughs> it's really, but it doesn't have to be. How do you the simplify solution, it? The way you simplify it is to say, look, one thing that we have all a limited resource of is time. Mm -hmm. So don't think about what are all your, all your values. Ask yourself, how would you want to spend your time to reflect your values? So if I looked at your weekly calendar, and one of the practices that changed my life, and I, 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 it's been studied, it's not just a pet project, it's been studied in thousands of controlled experiments, where when people make what's called an implementation intention, where they simply plan the time that they want to spend, what they want to do, and when they want to do it, that has been shown to be a very effective way to live out your values, to do what, it is, what you say you're going to do. Mm -hmm. So just start with next week. I'll give you a link in the show notes. I made this okay. tool that makes it very, very easy for anyone to just sit down with next week's calendar, right? Uh, seven days of next week and ask yourself, how much time do I want to devote to my various values, right? Yep. So you have to put in things like sleep. You have to put in things like commuting to work, you know, making breakfast, having lunch. You have to put that stuff in your calendar. And then what you will see is how much time is left over. 
And that's where you start putting in your values. How much time would make sense for me to live out my value of, of, of being a, 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 a caring husband or a devoted father or a, a loving friend? Where is that time on my calendar? Make sure I have that time for people I love in my life, uh, as well as in the workplace, right? Everybody I talk to, without fail, when I ask them, do you need time to concentrate at work? Like, do you need time to focus and reflect? Everybody said yes. And then I said, well, where exactly is that time? I don't know. <laughs> I'll get to it when I get to it. You won't get to it. It has to be planned for. And so right. by starting with the constraint of, of next week, right, of just looking at that counter and saying, okay, how am I going to fit in my values? That's much easier than saying, what are my values? And, you know, that, that stuff is just so hard to get your head around. Yeah. And so this, I, this technique that you're referring to is what you call time blocking in the book, right? And I, I remember having the wake up call myself about a year ago. Uh, and uh, ironically enough, it was at therapy. And I was trying to figure out why I was having so much, I don't know, I, I guess anxiety over the fact that my, my calendar, and I do live and die by a calendar, why my calendar wasn't bringing me happiness. I would look at my calendar and I would go, I've got nothing on this day that I'm yeah. happy about. Mm. And one of these like eye-opening moments was is well, you're not penciling in your happiness. There you go. There and you go. What were you missing? You know what it is for me is I love the work, I love the podcast, I love UX design. Uh, but above all that, I put my family. I've got three yeah. children and I put my family up at the top, but guess what? My family was not on my calendar. Yes. Oh, I did the same exact thing. So my wife and I actually met in college. And one of the one that we took a class together, we took a microeconomics class. And one of the terms we learned was this term residual beneficiary. A residual beneficiary is the chump that gets whatever's left over when a company goes out of business. So after mm -hmm. the debt holders have been paid, after the equity holders have been paid, the last person to get whatever's left is the residual beneficiary. Mm -hmm. About probably three, three or four years ago, my wife turned to me and said, you know, honey, you have made me the residual beneficiary of your time. Right in the heart. Right? And, that, and, that, and that really hurt. And it was true yep. because I would plan work. I would plan all the important stuff for my professional success. And then I would just expect that she would take whatever is left over, right? The scraps right. of time that were left over in my day. But she is the most important person in my, in my life. Why would I make her the last uh, in line to get time with me? Right. She should have time on my calendar as well. And so the people we love most should not be the residual beneficiaries. You know, and I want to know if this uh, resonates then with you, if this falls in line with it. One of the things that I personally have one of the biggest pet peeves with is when people say they're busy mm. and, and I go, you're not busy. You just, you've prioritized other things over whatever it may be. And there's nothing wrong with that, you know, I, but to give, to tell my kids I'm busy is telling them, no, I'm actually choosing my work over hanging out with you right now. Yeah. Uh, or yeah. your friends are saying, hey, let's hang out. It's like, sorry, I'm busy. Well, you're not busy. You've got a lot of things going on, but you're just not prioritizing these relationships. And maybe yeah. it's not the value that you've identified. And I, I think that's perfectly okay. There's nothing wrong. I think that feeling of, oh my God, I'm so busy. You know, it's, everything's so chaotic and hectic. That actually comes from when we don't know how to spend our time, when we don't decide in advance how we spend our not time. Not being intentional and, with it. Yeah. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Because what I argue in the book is that you know, few people have experienced this amazing sensation of going through their day and doing what they said they would do. Mm -hmm. We torture ourselves thinking that in the moment, we'll just play it by ear, right? Yeah. We'll just be, but we don't realize that actually deciding what to do in the moment takes a lot of cognitive effort. We spend so much time and brain cycles trying to figure out in the moment, what should I do? As opposed to planning ahead. And of course, the, by the way, the reason this is so dangerous is that we always tend to prioritize the urgent at the sacrifice, at the expense of the important. The values, right? That makes total and that's, sense. And that's terrible, right? Whether it's in the business context, we, we, we prioritize checking email real quick and responding to Slack channels because that's urgent as opposed to strategic thinking, which is important, right? Mm -hmm. Because that's not as, as urgent. But of course, if we never get to it, we're in big trouble. Same comes to our relationships, right? It's okay if you skip a, a, a lunch meeting with your buddy. It's okay if you skip that time with your, with your kids that one time or that second time. But if you don't ever get to it, that's when it's a big problem, right? right? You build these relationships over time. You need to invest in them in small increments. That's an example of something that's important but is never urgent. 
The only way to prioritize things that are important but not urgent is to plan ahead for them, is to make time in your schedule. But that feeling that I think so few people have actually experienced of getting to the end of their day and saying, wow, I spent my time the way I wanted to, is such a liberating feeling because then you don't have to ha have any guilt about it. Right. You can even do the things that people think about as distractions, right? I love Netflix movies. It's great, mm -hmm. but I watch them on my schedule. I love YouTube videos, but I watch them on my schedule. I love checking Facebook and Instagram and, and, and TikTok. They're great, but I don't use them whenever the app maker wants me to. I use them on my schedule, and when I use them, I'm not thinking in the back of my head, ooh, I really shouldn't because I have work to do. No, that is exactly what I wanted to do with my time. So I turned what used to be a distraction into an act of traction mm -hmm. by planning ahead, by saying this is what I want to do with my time. Yeah, I think that's really important distinction between the two. Uh, it's something that I, I think is is still rather difficult for me to make sure I'm intentionally using that time. Mm -hmm. uh, you talked about the urgency uh, becoming the most important thing, but the values don't change. Urgency might make you think it's changing, uh, but the values aren't changing. So I, I love that distinction there. One of the biggest questions I still have when it comes to time blocking, though, is if I sit down and I prioritize out my week and I've scheduled out my time, uh, my calendar ends up looking pretty blocked out. What do I do when something spontaneous comes up that maybe it is something that I do value and I want to now pencil it in? How do you handle those situations? Give me an example. Uh, let's say one of those things that I do value fairly highly is time with friends, right? Yeah. Uh, or building those, cultivating those relationships. And, you know, one evening this week, I've got... Uh, freelance projects, uh, you know, a career or family or whatever else is penciled in for those times. I'm using kind of umbrella terms for that. Uh, but then the opportunity comes along to go catch a movie with friends or go out to get a bite to eat with friends. And you're going, well, you know what? I haven't actually been able to spend a lot of time with that value. Can I now switch? No. <laughs> Let me tell you why. Yeah, I, um, go on, please. Yeah. Well, that's I like I like dramatic answers, so I, I gave that answer. But of course, the answer to everything in life is it depends. It depends. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, but I thought I'd pack a punch if I said no. In general, the answer is no. Generally, the answer is no because once you commit to your schedule and you prioritize your schedule, uh, you shouldn't change it in the moment, or else what's the point? So the yeah. idea is you're reviewing that schedule about a week's time. That's typically the cadence that most people review this. They look at the calendar, they make adjustments to it accordingly. Now, the exception, um, or, or let, me, let me say this, those spontaneous occurrences, if they come up in your life, and um, if, if you find, wow, there's this, this, this thing I just didn't plan for, but it sounds awesome and I want to go for it, and um, it's still consistent with your values. You're not, you're not dissing, uh, you're, you're, not, you're not making that at the expense of something else you wanted to do. So for example, if you plan to work on a big project and now you've got this opportunity to be with your friends, um, you, you, know, you, you don't use the excuse of, well, where am I going to get time with my friends? Because what I want you to do is in advance know when you're gonna get that time with your friends, yeah. okay? So if a spontaneous opportunity comes up and you say to yourself, well, I plan to watch Netflix, but I would much more enjoy going out with my friends in the moment, fine. I don't have a problem with that. As long as that's, what you, that's consistent with your values and that's what you plan to do with your time, that's okay with me. But I want you to also have that time in your, in your week planned for the non-spontaneous occurrences. Mm -hmm. Because if everything is spontaneous, then you risk not doing the things that are really important to you. If you just kind of wait around and be like, okay, well, whenever my friends call, that's when I'll get together with them. Right. You risk never actually getting together. So I'm okay if you say, you know, look, I'm going to exchange this time that I plan to do, uh, net, watch Netflix or play video games and instead go out with my friends because that's kind of the same value of, of, you know, entertainment or whatever. If you want to swap that out in the moment, that's fine with me as long as it's consistent with your values. But as long as you have consistent intervals in your calendar, to have time with your relationship. So if you have you know, a, a regular Friday night beers with your buddies, and that's on your calendar every week, or a church group you go to every Sunday, or a bowling league, or whatever it is that you do to fill your bucket of this need for, for, uh, for uh, psychological well-being through relationships, as long as that time is on your schedule regularly, and then in the moment you want to swap it out for something that is a, that is a, a similar value, so to speak, right? entertainment for entertainment, 
that's okay with me. But only if you have that time blocked out on a regular occurrence already. Yeah, that makes sense. And I appreciate that, that, uh, that advice right there. I am curious how you treat some of uh, the things on your calendar. One of the ones that I still have the biggest problem with is uh, text messages. Yeah. Because text messages come in from people who are important to me. Right. It, but the idea of urgency or scheduling and being intentional at that time, that one's a tough one for me. So how do you take oh, on that one's text easy. messaging? Well, that how so? Easy. What, would you have an iPhone? Yeah. Do not disturb while driving. Right. And you just utilize that. I, obviously, I know you can set that when you're not just driving. Do you utilize that then all day until your time is set? Well, so I have time in my day when I am interruptible. So, for example, one of the one of the uh, techniques I recommend is having office hours. Yep. Right. Especially if you work in an office where people send you, you know, silly questions constantly over email, as opposed to you know answering these questions uh, constantly, telling people, look, I will be in my office for two hours. And I will have my office hours. Come by, stop by anytime in those two hours. So I'm not saying you have to leave do not disturb while driving on all day long. And by the way, to explain people what this is, uh, I think it, they have it on Android as well, I'm pretty sure. But the idea here is uh, it's certainly on, on iOS devices. When you turn on do not disturb while driving, anyone who texts or calls you will receive an automatic reply mm -hmm. that says, you know, you can customize the message. It can't, you know, the, the default is I'm driving, right. but I, I customize it to say I'm indistractable. It says, if this is urgent, text me with the word urgent. Yep. So if, oh my God, you know, your house is on fire, you need to call me right away, the person will text the word urgent and now the message will come through. But of course, that almost never happens, right? Right. So, so you can get back to it after that focused work time, after that hour, hour and a half, two hours, however much time you need to do focused work. So you can check that message. Uh, but do it again on your schedule, not on someone else's. So how often are you blocking out time for being indistractable so that you can respond to text messages? But how often do I allow myself that time to check messages? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so I, I have time. So first thing in the morning, actually, so um, when I get up, I cater I have this technique I use in the, that I describe in the book to categorize emails. Mm -hmm. So uh, first thing, one of the first things I do is I you know, take 15 minutes in the morning. It's in my calendar to do that. 15 minutes of sorting through any, any messages. So, you know, I'm checking any um, uh, emails that came in. I'm not answering them. We can talk about how do I manage email in a bit but I'm sorting through them. I have a labeling system that, that I described in the book that has reduced the time I spent on email dramatically. Um, then I'm checking, you know, text messages or social media, any, any uh, message on social media. So it takes me maybe 15 minutes in the morning. Uh, and then I have another time uh, right before lunch that I check in again. And then my biggest stretch is in the evening. I have time after dinner in my calendar, an hour and a half for social media time. Yeah. Uh, and so, and email, email and social media time in, in my calendar every day, but only for the urgent emails. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm in and out of there quite a few times per day, but again, it's done with intent. I'm not using it when I'm feeling bored or when I'm feeling lonely or when I can't think of anything else better to do, mm -hmm. or I'm working on a project and it's a really hard project. So let me, let me escape that uncomfortable sensation by, uh, doing one of these distractions. You know, one of the light bulb moments I've had now in talking with you and I, I think this is uh, it, well, it's extremely important for me is over the years as I've lived and died by my calendar, there have been times where I felt uh, a prisoner of the calendar, mm. that I just felt like there is no more flexibility in here for me to do, uh, for me to be spontaneous. Mm. And um, one of the light bulb moments that I'm having right now is I think I probably only feel that way because not all my values are represented on that calendar. Mm, because you're only putting in work stuff? Yeah, I've only got work stuff. I've only yeah. got the project stuff. And uh, I, you would then feel trapped by that calendar because totally. internally I've got the desires and the values that there are other things that I should be on this calendar. Absolutely. So maybe that's why I'm feeling a bit of this trapped. Right. And the idea here, when you make a time box calendar, by the way, this is only one technique of four in the book. I don't want people to think the whole book is about time blocking your calendar. No, it's not. But, I may even spend too much no, time no, on it, but good. I love this because again, I've, here's my field notes book right here. And yeah. I've lived and died by one of these in my pocket. Uh, for the last four years. No, and, it's, it's uh, awesome. It's a I very, very technique. helpful technique. But the idea here is that it's not that you make a calendar once and that's it. It's, it's uh, you know, carved in stone. The idea is that you iterate on it week mm -hmm. to week. 
So you look at, you take 15 minutes, I have 15 minutes every Sunday evening where I look at the week ahead and I adjust my calendar to make sure it's easier to follow the next week. So if I felt like, wow, I was kind of deficient there in the, in one category, I need more time for email, or I didn't spend enough time with friends, or I thought maybe I spent too much time with my, whatever it might be, I'm adjusting accordingly. But this is definitely not something that is just about, you know, being productive all the time. If you yeah. want time for meditation, for prayer, for reflection, for taking a walk, for painting, for reading, for writing, whatever it is that is, is important for you to do, Whatever is consistent with your values, I want you to have that time on your calendar, even if it's for playing video games or watching a movie. That's great. There's nothing wrong with it. I want you to plan that time because then you can have that time without guilt. Because what happens with a lot of people, this is what I used to do. The more things on my to-do list, the more I would seek escape, right? I'd be like, oh my God, I have so much to do. You know what? Screw it. Let's watch some Netflix. (laughs) <laughs> and then I didn't really enjoy either, right? I didn't get anything sure. done, the professional stuff done. And even when I was watching Netflix, I felt guilty about it, right? Because I probably <laughs> should be doing something productive. As opposed to now, no. One of the things that I have to do today, because I plan to do it, is to allow myself guilt-free to, to be entertained. It doesn't, it's not yeah. that everything on your calendar has to necessarily be productive. Quite the opposite. No, I appreciate that. Uh, I've only got a couple minutes left with you, and I've got a couple follow-up questions I want to get back to. Uh, at the very beginning of the podcast, you mentioned that you've seen this book have an impact on people. What type of feedback have you received from people who are actually applying these techniques? What have you heard? Yeah, so one of the most um, gratifying uh, p- uh, pieces of feedback I've received is the effect that it's having on people's relationship with their kids. So there's this whole section in the book about how to have an, uh, how to raise indistractable kids, mm-hmm. and um, it goes much deeper than I think the traditional analysis of why kids are overusing technology, why they're getting addicted to it, or whatnot, and and really delves into what's called the needs displacement hypothesis. Uh, and and uh, this is 40, 50 year old research based on self determination theory. It's the most widely accepted theory of human motivation and flourishing. And I have heard from several parents uh, who have read this section of the book and then had conversations with their kids about it, that it helps them see and understand their children in a whole new light. And that's been really, really gratifying. What is, how, or let me ask this, and hopefully you're right with this question. How has your relationship with your daughter changed uh, since becoming indistractable? Well, she has given me a compliment. You know, you know, children are hypocrisy detection devices, right? <laughs> they are like little radars looking for when you screw up. And so I like that my daughter helps me stay accountable, actually. So yeah. recently she did give me a compliment. She, she said, you know what, Daddy, you're, you're doing a good job. You know, I can, I can tell that, that you're much more present, and that means a lot to me. And how old is she? She's 11. That's cute. Yeah. Very cool. Well, Nir, I appreciate all these, this time that you've spent with us. I appreciate uh, what you've gone into detail on, further defining and and, and clarifying. Uh, these tips, I think, are super helpful for anyone who finds himself uh, not centered on the values that they want to be centered on in life and maybe pulled in different directions. The book is absolutely fantastic. Uh, I'll encourage everyone. You, you won't have to do a whole lot of Googling. If you search near, you're going to find it. Uh, anyways, it's a great book. I'll have links to it uh, in the show notes. Uh, Thank you so much for your time. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks so much for having me. Appreciate it. Uh, This has been another episode of Design Today. Thank you, everyone, for joining us.